Hello and good evening all. We are going to commence the lecture on colorectal cancer. Yesterday, we talked about the epidemiology of colorectal cancer. We talked about the relevant anatomy, the risk factors of colorectal cancer, as well as the pathological types and the histological types. Today, we will commence the discussion on staging for colorectal cancer. Now, the staging of a disease describes the extent of growth and spread of that disease. It determines the choice of treatment and the prognosis of that disease. When you see a disease with several staging, several forms of staging, it means there are some limitations in a particular type of staging that will require modification. Now, staging for colon cancer, there are several types of staging. The Duke staging, the modified Duke staging, a slacola modification of Duke staging, the TNM staging. All these various staging are aimed at improving a, a staging modality that is all encompassing. Now, originally was the Duke staging. And if you notice, this Duke staging have a limitation in that it does not take into consideration a distant metastasis. And hence, it requires modification. Now, before we go into the staging, you should know the layers. You should know the layers of the colon. The colon has the mucosa, okay? And this mucosa has the epithelial cells on the basement membrane. Then the next layer is the submucosa. The submucosa layer. Okay. Next to the submucosa is the muscularis propria. The muscularis propria or the muscle layer has two layers. The inner circular muscle. Okay. It has an inner circular muscle and the outer longitudinal muscle, okay? So these two layers from the muscularis propria. And lastly, the serosa layer. Now, when you talk about staging, it start from involvement of the mucosa down to penetration up to the serosal space. From there, it now moves into adjacent structure and then to a distant metastasis. So you need to take in mind you have various layers, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and the serosa. So these are the various layers. And we said the muscularis has two layers, the inner circular muscle and the outer longitudinal muscle. Now, coming to the first form of staging, which is the Duke staging. Duke staged colon cancer into 
A, B, C. Look A, it is confined to the boil wall, the mucosa and the submucosa. The tumor is confined to the mucosa and the submucosa. B, it extends across the boil wall, okay, to the muscularis proper, but no lymph node is involved. While C, the lymph nodes are involved. Now, what is the limitation of this staging? You can see it doesn't take into consideration distant metastasis. Hence, it requires a modification. Then the modified Duke further improved the staging to add B1 and B2 as well as D, which is distant metastasis. Okay, now A, the growth is limited to the rectal wall. Then B, extending into extra rectal tissue, but no lymph node spread. B1, invading muscularis proper. B2, invading into or through the serosa. C, lymph node secondaries. Lymph nodes are involved. D, distant spread. So you can see the modified Duke staging has improved by adding a distant metastasis. Now the Aslacola modification of the Duke staging. Now, if you remember the anatomy, we described the lymphatic channels, the lymphatic vessels and the lymph nodes of the colon. Now, the anatomy of the lymph nodes is very important with regards the um, vessels because the lymphatic channels, the lymphatic vessels spread along the arteries. Intraoperatively, you won't see the lymphatic vessels, but these vessels run along the course of these arteries. So it is very important the staging take into consideration the lymphatic, the blood supply of this colon. So this further, the aslacola modification take into consideration the extent of involvement of the lymph node. A is confined to the mucosa. Okay, if you remember our drawing, we said the inner layer is the mucosa, okay, the epithelium and the basement membrane, then the submucosa, okay, then the muscularis propria that has both the inner circular and the outer longitudinal muscle and the serosa. Okay, Duke's Aslacola A, it means the tumor is confined to the mucosa here. That is A. Then B1, it extends but does not penetrate the muscularis mucosa. Now you can see it has gone through, but it has not penetrated the muscularis. Then that is B1. Then B2 penetrates the muscularis mucosa, but no lymph node is involved. 
So it has involved the muscularis, that is B2. Then C1, it is limited to the boil wall, okay? With paracolic lymph node involved. If you remember, the lymph nodes that are just by the side of the boil wall are now involved, it has spread. Why is this C1 paracolic? Now, C2 spread to the lymph node at the highest point of ligation. If you remember, there are arteries, the mesenteric arteries. They are branches from the abdominal aorta. Now, because the lymphatics go along this artery, if you are doing surgery, if you want to take off the tumor along, it, along with the lymphatics, you have to ligate the vessel at the point of origin from the abdominal aorta. So that is termed the highest point of ligation. So the lymph nodes, when the lymph nodes that are at this paraaortic area are involved, they are termed C2. Then D is when there is distant metastasis. So you can see how the staging of this tumor is improving from the duke to the modified duke to the Aslacola's modification of duke, then to the TNM staging, where the T represents the primary tumor, N represents the lymph nodes, and M for metastasis. TX. The primary tumor cannot be assessed, okay? Maybe due to lack of facility to pick the tumor. It is so small that you cannot assess it. Then T0, no evidence of primary tumor. Maybe before presentation, the tumor was excised. It was removed. TIS is carcinoma in situ. That means the tumor has not breached the basement membrane. If the mucosa is here, the tumor is within the cells here. It has not invaded the basement membrane. That is called carcinoma in situ. T1, the tumor has invaded the submucosa. Okay, if this is the submucosa, the tumor has invaded the submucosa. Okay, that is T1. Okay, this is TIS. TIS. This is T1. Tumor has involved the muscularis propria. It's T2. Okay, when it has grown to involve the muscularis propria, that is T2. Okay, don't forget this muscularis propria has two layers. Then after that, you have the serosal layer. This is T2. T3, it has involved it has invaded the subserosa. That means when you look at the boil, you will see evidence of tumor beneath the serosa, but it has not breached. Then T4 is the tumor has breached the serosa, it's now in the peritoneum, and it will invade adjacent structure. So this is the T staging. While regarding the N, which is the regional lymph node involvement, NX, regional lymph nodes cannot be assessed. N0, no regional lymph node metastasis. N1, metastasis to one to three regional lymph nodes. 
N2 metastasis to four or more regional lymph nodes, while N is distant metastasis MX, distant metastasis cannot be assessed. M0, no distant metastasis, and M1, distant metastasis. Now, this table shows the various stages in the TNM Duke and modified Duke, the Aslacola modification of Duke, as well as the group staging. So whenever you hear a tumor is stage four, it means it is an advanced tumor. There is distant metastasis, okay? When they say stage one, it is early. When it is stage zero, it is carcinoma in situ. So this is the group staging. Now, how do these tumors spread? These tumors spread either direct to adjacent structures via the lymphatic vessels, via bloodstream, or transperitoneal seedlings. When you say direct spread, it spread to the adjacent structures. Okay? In the boil, it spread transversely to encycle it. If this is the lumen of the boil, okay? And there is a tumor here. The direction of spread of this tumor will go transversely like this. So it keeps on encycling, okay? It keeps on encroaching until it becomes completely circumferential. And of course, you know, as it's encycling, at the same time, it is narrowing the lumen until it eventually causes obstruction. Now, you should know that this encroachment or encycling, it takes about six months for a tumor to cover one fourth, if you divide this into four, it takes six months for it to cover one fourth of the circumference of the bowel. Okay? So if it takes six months to do this, it means it takes about two years to become completely circumferential. It takes about two years for a tumor to be completely circumferential. Okay. Spread in long longitudinal axis is limited. Okay. If this is the longitudinal axis of the tumor, it does not spread continuously. Okay. It is limited. It hardly goes beyond five centimeters longitudinally. Microscopically, it does not spread beyond five centimeters. It spreads through all layers to involve adjacent structures. Invasion may lead to formation of internal fistula because this tumor may invade an adjacent structure. And when it adheres, there will now be a means of communication between these two hollow structures, causing an internal fistula. It can also spread via lymphatics. And you should know, growth through lymphatics spread to paracolic lymph nodes, intermediate lymph nodes, and principal group of lymph nodes, which we discussed the sequence of spread yesterday. The group of lymph nodes draining the colon, the N1 are the immediate nodes that are adjacent to the boil wall, N2 are those that are along the vessels, and N3 are those at the origin of the vessels. Then you should know the nodal spread in carcinoma of the colon is sequential from N1 
to N2, then to N3. However, in about 30% of cases, nodal involvement may skip a tear. In 30% of cases, it will just spread by skipping a tear of lymph node. We've seen direct spread, we've seen lymphatic spread, and it can spread through the blood. 33 to 40% of carcinoma of the colon spread to the liver via portal veins. As we mentioned yesterday, metastatic um, cancers to the liver at presentation, about 30% of these patients already have metastasis to the liver. And how do they present? This is very important. Secondary may be either solitary or multiple, present as liver with hard, okay, umbilicated nodules. Now, it is very important on your imaging to be able to differentiate metastatic colorectal liver cancer and primary liver cancer. How do you differentiate both? Whether this tumor you are seeing in the liver is metastatic to the liver or it is primarily a tumor of the liver. The way you differentiate both is for metastatic colorectal cancers, one, you see an umbilicated lesion. Okay, you see a lesion that is umbilicated like this. And secondly, the other parenchyma of the liver is normal. While in metastatic colorectal um, primary liver cell cancer, they are not umbilicated and the other parenchyma of the liver is diseased. It's spread to the lungs in 22%, adrenals in 11%, kidneys, bones, 10%, and to the brain. Now, transperitoneal seedlings. When tumors are spread to the peritoneal surface, they drop as seedlings and ascites results. How do the ascites result? They result when there is elaboration of vascular endothelial growth factors by the tumors. And these vascular endothelial growth factors elaborate new vessels on the peritoneal surface. They, call, they cause what is called neovascularization. And these will now secrete a lot of fluid into the peritoneum, causing ascites. Now, the clinical presentation of colonic cancers. Now, it is very important you understand the clinical features, how they present, okay? And how you recognize a patient <clears throat> with colonic tumors. Now, you should know that the age, it occurs usually after the age of 50 years, usually in the sixth and seventh decade of life. Familial type present in younger age group and the familial types tend to be more aggressive. Okay, as we mentioned, rectal tumors, are commoner in males, while colonic cancers are commoner in females. The presentation may be insidious, gradual in onset in 75% of cases, or it may present urgently, okay, as an emergency with in 18% of cases, okay, with intestinal obstruction or with perforation in 7% of cases. The commonest and important symptom is change in bowel habits. 
Now, please, you have to take note of this. Any patient that is presenting, okay, greater than 50 years with change in boil habit, you must evaluate that patient for colonic tumor. Change in boil habit and abdominal pain. Okay, change in boil habit may be constipation, diarrhea, or alternating constipation with diarrhea. Patient will be having diarrhea alternating with constipation. What happens is when a patient has obstruction in the colon, maybe somewhere, there is a tumor here causing intestinal obstruction. And you see there will be impediment of flow of content. And because of this obstruction, patient will develop constipation. Now, because of stasis here, bacteria at or feces that is here, there is a lot of secretions and this feces will be liquefied. When it is liquefied, it will now provide passage through this narrow opening. So, patient will now have diarrhea. So patient will be having alternating constipation and diarrhea. Now, passage of blood or mucus in the feces. Bleeding from the tumors will be seen in the stool. And of course, this bleeding, when it is seen, it depends on the part, the type of the bleeding, the nature of the bleeding, whether it's a bright red blood or it is a blood that is mixed with the stool, okay? It gives you an idea where the tumor is located, okay? We'll discuss that shortly. Now, other symptoms will include noise in the abdomen, audible borborygmy from increasing obstruction. They will be having abnormal sounds in their abdomen that is called borborygmy, abdominal pain, distension, and even dyspepsia, especially when there is distension around the transverse colon or tumor around the transverse colon. Now, we said the bleeding will tell probably where the tumor is likely originating from. Now, if you look at the colon, don't forget, you have several parts as we described yesterday, okay? The tumor might be in the cecum, it might be in the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid, or rectum. Now, we said this colon is about 150 cm. If you have bleeding at this cecum here, before it gets to the anus and brought out as bleeding per rectum, it has changed maybe to melina, except if it is massive bleeding. So it might present as if it's an upper GI bleeding that usually presents with melina if the quantity is not so massive to present as bright red blood. So in Minimal blood coming from the cecum, they, might, they may present as melina. Any bleeding coming from this side, okay? 
from the sigmoid and above, <clears throat> they will completely mix. They mix with two. So it will be mixed. You cannot separate blood from the stool. You just see a stool that is mixed with blood. If it is coming from the rectum, because the rectum is just 12 to 15 cm, it will coat the surface of the stool. It's going to coat the surface of the stool because there is no enough time for mixing with the stool. If it is coming from the anal canal, usually, like in hemorrhoids, it's after defecation, you will now see bleeding. After passage of stool, you will now see the bleeding. Okay? Now, right-sided tumors, when they are growth, they commonly present with the three A's of malignancy. We mentioned they will have features of anemia, asthenia, weight loss, and anorexia. Those are the three A's of malignancy, and they are classical of right-sided colonic tumors. And this mass could be palpable, okay? They have this palpable mass in the right iliac fossa, which is not moving with respiration. Okay, it could be mobile or fixed if it has involved the posterior abdominal wall. But usually it is mobile, except when it has grown advanced and it is fixed to the abdominal wall, it is unlikely to be mobile. It is non tender, hard in consistency. Well localized with impaired resonant notes. So you should know on the right side, especially cecal pole tumors, they present as abdominal mass in the right iliac fossa with all these features that are described. The left sided tumors present with colicky pain, altered bowel habits alternating constipation and diarrhea because the left-sided uh, tumors, as we mentioned, they are annular and tubular. Yesterday, we said they are annular tumors. They are circumferential, less than 5 cm. Or tubular, they are circumferential or greater than 5 cm. So because of that, they will present as a constricting tumors and obstructive tumors. And these will cause intestinal obstruction, okay? Later, may present with complete colonic obstruction. Now, sigmoid colon tumors. Sigmoid colon and the rectum. Most important symptoms here is rectal bleeding. Bleeding is characterized, as we mentioned, by coating the surface of the stool when it is coming from the rectum. Okay, but in the sigmoid colon, which is about 50 30 to 50 centimeters long, it might have enough time to mix with the stool. Tenesmus. Tenesmus is a frequent urge to defecate, which is fruitless, productive of no stool. They just pr produce minimal mucus or no stool. So they will have that frequent urge to defecate. Okay, they go to toilets, but they won't pass any stool. And yet, the urge to defecate is still there. That is termed tenesmus. And whenever a patient has tenesmus, it localizes the tumor to the rectum. It, it signifies that this tumor is in the rectum because it's exerting a mass effect which constantly stimulates the defecation reflex. They may present with spurious diarrhea. Spurious means false. 
because of the large amount of mucus that is produced by this tumor, okay, it will accumulate and during the morning they will go and pass a large amount of diarrhea. That is not a true diarrhea, it is from mucus that is produced by the tumor that accumulates in the rectum, okay? Now, rectal tumors can present with secondary hemorrhoids when they obstruct the superior rectal vein. So any patient above 40 years with hemorrhoids should be properly evaluated by doing minima. Minimum, you should do a sigmoidoscopy. Minimum, you should do a sigmoidoscopy, okay? To ensure that there is no any tumor in the rectum. Now, there may be involvement of adjacent structures. These tumors might invade the, the sacral plane, okay? And they invade the sacral plexus and they cause sacral pain when the plexus is invaded. They could be so, it, this could be so discomforting. It could be, they could be in severe pain when it has invaded the sacral plexus. There could be a rectal vaginal fistula. When the rectum, if you remember the anatomy of the rectum and the uterus, the rectum is just behind. And if there is two more, it invades the vagina, you will see the patient passing feces per vagina, okay? They may have rectal vest, um, they could have rectovesical fistula when it invades the bladder. Okay, when it invades the bladder, patients will be having um, when it invades the bladder, patient will be having fecaluria, passage of feces in the urine, and pneumaturia, passage of gas in the urine. Okay, these are advanced tumors invading the adjacent structures. They may also compress on the ureters. Okay. And when they compress on the ureters, patient will present with hydrouretters and hydronephrosis. Tumors of the transverse colon can invade the stomach, giving gastrocolic fistula. Because if you remember, the stomach bed. The transverse colon forms part of the stomach bed. Okay, the spleen, the pancreas, transverse colon, okay, the left kidney and renal, and renal gland, they are all part of the stomach bed. So if the tumor is in the transverse colon and it's the stomach, it invades the stomach, this patient could come up with gastrocolic fistula. And one important presentation of a patient with gastrocolic fistula is vomiting of feces, okay? When you see patient with colonic tumor and they vomit, and the, the vomitus is frankly feculent or it contains feces, it means that patient has a transverse colon tumor that has invaded the stomach. That when you examine these patients, they may reveal distension, ascites, you might palpate an abdominal mass, and hepatomegaly. Now, don't forget the commonest site of metastasis of colonic cancer is to the liver. The commonest site of metastasis of colon cancer is to the liver and they may present with hepatomegaly and we describe how they appear. They may appear as umbilicated lesion that could be solitary or multiple 
the other part of the liver parenchyma will appear normal. When you do a digital rectal examination, the tumors in the rectum that are, if less than 10 centimeters from the anal vag, you can feel the tumor from your digital rectal examination. And this tumor, these tumors, they may appear hard, okay? They may be encycling the lumen and narrowing it. Or they may be raised ulcers, meaning it could be an ulcerated tumor or it could even be an annular or a tubular tumor. Okay, we describe those pathology. Now, when you are examining a patient with rectal tumor, you should note the following features. One, the distance from the anal vag. The distance of that tumor from the anal vag. You need to take note of that. Two, the location. Is it anterior? Is it posterior? Is it on the right? Is it on the left? Or is it circumferential? Three, the surface. Is it irregular, smooth? Okay, you have to take note of that. Ulcerated with raised edges and all that. Four, you want to take note of the consistency. Is it hard, firm, soft? Five, can you go above the tumor? Six, is this tumor fixed? Okay, is it fixed to the mucosa? Okay, so you have to examine all these. Then seven, when you remove your finger, the examining finger, is it stained with blood or mucus? If it is stained with blood, that tumor has contact bleeding. So these are very important features you need to take note of when you are doing a digital rectal examination in a patient with rectal tumor. Now, as we mentioned, it takes up to six months for a tumor to occupy one fourth of the circumference. And hence, it takes two years to be completely circumferential. That is very important for you to know because it will tell you when a patient presents with complete obstruction, obstipation, at least that tumor must have been there for about two years. Now, we are going to talk about how colonic tumors present as an emergency, okay? Now, they can present with acute on chronic intestinal obstruction. Because the obstruction has been there, it is a form of chronic obstruction. That's why they are having alteration in bowel habits. So that is a form of chronic obstruction. That is why they are having borborygmy, the abnormal sounds in the abdomen. Now, when there is sudden occlusion of this lumen, either by growth of the tumor or by fecal impaction, it becomes an acute intestinal obstruction where they present with sudden onset abdominal pain that is colicky in nature, constipation, abdominal distension, and vomiting. So it has become an acute on chronic intestinal obstruction and it requires immediate resuscitation and 
intervention. Now, these tumors could present with perforation and generalized peritonitis. They could present with perforation and generalized peritonitis. And you should know that fecal peritonitis is more severe because of the bacterial contamination because of the bacterial content of that um, feces. Now they can present with abscesses, okay? When they form fistula, when the tumor breaks, okay? The bowel wall and it leaks the contents, okay? This will form collection that will form intra-abdominal abscesses. And patient will be having abdominal pain, fever, okay? And other features of the underlying condition. Then lastly, they can present with acute bleeding. They can have massive bleeding. And this will present as an emergency. So you need to know when you are asked on how colonic tumors present as an emergency, they can present as an acute on chronic intestinal obstruction, perforation, okay, paracolic abscesses, and acute bleeding. So I think we are going to stop here because um, it's time. So I'm going to entertain questions. If you have any question, I'll allow you to unmute. Then um, I will now entertain your question. You can unmute yourself, then you ask question. Thank you very much for participating. So you can go ahead to ask your question, if you have any. Okay, it appears there are no questions. Okay, since there are no questions, we are going to um, end the lecture. So the next lecture, we are going to complete um, other aspects of colon and rectal cancer where we'll talk about the various investigative modalities as well as the treatment for colon and rectal cancer. In the absence of any question, we are going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.